Hello, and welcome to Making a Show, a Props Master's Point of View, hosted by the Louisville Creative Arts Academy and presented by Ellie Fangman. Before we begin, I want to give a shout out to this book, The Properties Director's Toolkit by Shanda J. Strawn and Lisa Schlenker. They had a lot of great information that I will be referencing in part one, the three C's of leadership. That was extremely helpful, and it's a great resource if you're looking to learn more, so check it out. The Three C's of Leadership, Part 1, Collaboration. Here's a great quote from the book, The Properties Director's Toolkit. Collaboration is the heartbeat of working in props. Everything from start to finish involves input and ideas from others. So what makes a good collaborator? A good collaborator can communicate their ideas clearly which is a skill, and it's an important skill because building a show is a long conversation between you, your team, and the production team. What does it take to become a better communicator if it's a skill? Well, just like any skills, it takes practice. And we have two great tools that we can use to help us sharpen that skill, and those tools are asking questions and actively listening. One of those questions you could ask would be, what do you want this prop to communicate? Sometimes items have a history or significance not evident in the script, but evident to the director's vision of the world. Or it's an item we know has significance, but we're not exactly sure how that significance should present itself physically. Take the adventure book from Up. This book has a very specific feeling to it. It's obviously of the period, and we can make some inferences based on the research that we do of that period. However, we would need to ask follow-up questions from the director and designer about what this book is meant to represent. In the movie Up, it represents the relationship between Carl and his wife, which is intricate. They spend an entire life together. So what are those pictures? What would have been their greatest adventure? Another good question to ask is how does the narrative of this play and its characters affect the physical world around them? This isn't always the case, but a lot of scripts insinuate that the characters existed in this world before you came to see them. For a simple example, it's the difference between thinking, I need a blanket for Anna's room in scene three, versus we need a blanket for Anna's room, scene three. Which one would she get herself? Where did she get it from? Does it have a story? A t-shirt quilt is different than a handmade antique quilt, which is even different than a factory-made throw. They all have a different story behind them. This can lead to an interesting line of dialogue about the socioeconomic status of the characters in the play. This line of questioning can also be a good exercise and can be the difference between a set that feels fabricated and a world that's been lived in. It's important, though, that we also learn what objects need this sort of thought and care and which can just be a prop. It's part of learning to balance our priorities, which is another important skill to have as a collaborator. Another thing a good collaborator does is supports their team. I firmly believe that all good teams are built on a foundation of trust, open communication, and a willingness to support one another. As an industry, we work very hard, often for long hours, so it's important that we know we have each other's backs, both as co-workers and as human beings with needs. So that brings us to our second C of the three C's of leadership, which is Communication. A good communicator uses their voice to advocate for appropriate expectations for the shop, for the designer, for administration, and for other areas of production. You will work with directors and designers whose expectations are unrealistic for the resources you have. It's a learned skill that is difficult to teach because at its core, it's learning how to set healthy boundaries. We are human beings with basic needs, and those needs should not have to be fought for. At the end of the day, it's just a show, but the people on your team are real people. Does your team really need to stay late again? Of course, everyone wants to work hard, but part of having a healthy work ethic is knowing what your needs are and advocating for them. You can't put on a successful show if everyone's burnt out. You may work with people in this industry that have a negative and unhealthy philosophy about what life in theater has to be. They will say you have to work long hours, that you have to put finishing a set piece before eating, sleeping, going home. 
but this is not true. It's possible to have a healthy work-life balance in the arts, and the way we start to change that toxic thinking around it in theater is by advocating for ourselves and our needs and not backing down. Obviously, every situation has its nuances, and you can ask yourself, could this decision to work late, not eat, etc., harm my physical or mental health? Is it worth it? Do I really need to do it now? Or could I finish it in the allotted time and still have my break? These questions will make the difference between a healthy work ethic and a road to burnout. As my good friend and fellow designer says, working hard means knowing how to balance your priorities and enforcing healthy boundaries. Another side of this is a designer who expects a prop that for whatever reason, be it budget, skill set, or accessibility, can't happen. It's our job to make it work. This is where those questions come in. Gathering as much information as you can about why they want that specific piece or action helps you to figure out a way to deliver it with another solution. Take, for example, a couch. Say the couch the designer or director requested is too expensive. Could we possibly buy and refurbish a similar couch? Would that be cheaper? Thinking about materials and labor costs, of course. And remember, finding a financial incentive will help your supervisor justify it and encourage them to work with you in placating the designer and the director. Next up, a good communicator is organized and maintains accurate and organized files and documents and shares them openly. That's an important part of this. Sharing your props, lists, and documents with your artisans helps them to make informed decisions when planning out the timeline for their own projects. Part of being a good manager is listening to your team. They are the artisans building the project, so their insight is valuable. They may have ideas that could greatly benefit the production. When I work as a props master, I like to have a small meeting at the beginning and end of each day. That way everyone was always on the same page and we could continue to work as an efficient team. A good communicator also strives to be a step ahead and seeks input and advice before it's needed. In theater, this is seeing the note before it becomes a note. Again, this is a developed skill, but one of the ways you get good at it is by looking at each prop as an entire process from conceptualization to build and through its actions and purpose on stage. Participating in this exercise can help you identify potential problems and come up with creative solutions to solve them. For example, it's a small secret that a bar in a musical will almost always need to be weight-bearing, even if they say they're not going to dance on it. If you can afford it, it's better just to build a sturdy one than have to rebuild later when the director wants to dance. Also, this makes you look like you are already ahead of this curve which directors appreciate. Worst comes to worst, they don't use it, but either way, you're prepared. You can also seek input from your team or from fellow collaborators, as well as the internet and your reference library. A reference library is a collection of books that you use for reference. I have books on building, crafting, architectural and historical periods, as well as less obvious resources, like a book of card tricks or a book on table etiquette. I'd highly suggest starting your own. There are just some things you can't find on the internet. You can also reach out to your community. When working as a props master at the Illinois Shakespeare Festival last summer, we had to furnish an entire bar. I needed dozens of different liquor bottles and only had about a month to collect them. My creative solution was to reach out to the local bars, asking them if they could put aside their empty bottles so that I could collect them. And they were happy to! Every Friday, I drove to three different bars around town and walked out with crates of empty liquor bottles. So we ended up having plenty of set dressing for free, which is not something I would have gotten if I had been too nervous to ask and reach out to my community. And coming on the third C of leadership, it is creativity, which I have a great quote here from the Properties Director's Toolkit, which is creativity is the underlying quality defining everything done in the shop and is the basis of thought when approaching a new design. And I want to give a big shout out again to this book, the Properties Director's Toolkit. It gave me a lot of inspiration and they laid out these great seven elements of creativity, which we will look at now. 
So first off, we have innovation, which is improving on a previous solution or experience. This looks like offering solutions during brainstorming sessions, actively listening to the needs of your team, and by seeking advice and new experiences. Second, we have invention, which is creating something entirely new. This one is pretty self-explanatory, although it's worth mentioning that nothing is unique. Everything is influenced or inspired by something. Coming up after invention is imagination, which is being able to form images and ideas freely. And this ability is essential to being able to come up with creative problem-solving solutions. And fourth, we have improvisation, which is solving a problem within limited time or resources. Again, like most of what we've discussed, this is a skill. A way you can get better at this is by challenging yourself to think through the entirety of the process and then think through it as if everything has gone wrong. Try and think of every possible problem and then try and think of a viable, doable by you, no budget solutions. The fifth element of creativity is curiosity or the insatiable desire to learn and explore. Props as a field is ever evolving. To do the job well, you are always a student, open to learning new traits, skills, and general world knowledge. You could do this job your whole life and you would never master it all. There's just too much to learn for one lifetime. Next, we have flexibility or the willingness to adapt to new information or viewpoints. Remember, this is a collaborative art, which means we all have to work together. Just as it is important to believe in yourself and have confidence in your ideas, it's also important to recognize when your idea isn't the best one being offered. It's not personal if someone doesn't like your idea. It may just not be the best one for the production. This also means that pieces you have spent a lot of time and money on will be cut. Props get cut, ideas get turned down, and that's okay. It's not a reflection on your capabilities as a props master or artisan. If you really feel passionately about an idea, though, there are appropriate ways to advocate for them. But even if you think it's wrong, if the director cuts it, we just have to deal with it sometimes. And lastly, we have vision, seeing the what if or the wheel of the product and process. Like we've discussed before, thinking about these what ifs is vital to running an efficient team, shop, and show build. Okay, that was the three C's of leadership. And to close out part one, and before we move on to part two, I just wanted to share an, one more quick quote from the Properties Director's Toolkit. As Properties Directors, we are listeners, educators, and advocates for the developmental process of creating and making props. We support and foster the interconnectedness of all production elements in this messy, brilliant, creative endeavor called theater. Okay, so now I'm going to do my best to walk you through how I would procure a prop based on a rehearsal report note. So the report I receive tells me that the director wants 10 cups, preferably metal, and to see the Gaston scene in Beauty and the Beast movie 2019 for reference. So the first thing I want to point out, just as someone who has gotten a lot of rehearsal report notes, is that SMs, stage managers, and directors don't always give you details like this, specifically the detail of them wanting to be metal. So it's important to ask questions in your follow-up emails, asking if they have any preferences. A few other questions I would make sure to ask the SM would be, will the glasses be drunk from? This is important for me to know, both planning logistically of how the glasses are going to be stored backstage, if I need to budget in for liquid to be bought to be drunk by the cast, and also just knowing safety-wise, covering my bases with allergies, um, both to liquids and metal, since they specifically asked for metal, both in the cast and the crew. And and to start having the conversation with the SM about if the scene specifically has dancing in it, is there any safety concern with the dancers and a possible spill? A few additional questions I have for myself are, have I bought something like this before? And if so, can I estimate the cost? Do we have any in stock? Does a the local theater have any they would be willing to rent? And does the time period of the play match that of the reference? And will the periods be clashing? So for this exercise, I will pretend that I have not bought something like this before. I don't have any in stock. 
uh, local theater has does not have any to be willing to rent to me and the time periods will not be clashing. But sometimes for that last one, you need to do additional research. So the next thing I would do would be to look up the reference scene they mentioned in the rehearsal report note and watch that. For the purposes of this video and copyright reasons, I can't show it to you, but you're welcome to look up the video of the Gaston Beauty and the Beast 2019 movie scene, and you can see the cups we're talking about. Okay, so after watching the reference clip, I know that the period in question is late 1700s. I also already should have known that based off of the script, but it's good to also double check that you're getting reference from the same period that you're working in in the script. So the first thing I'm going to Google is late 1700s beer stein. Even if you didn't know it was called a stein, you could search mug or cup and probably still find it. So here I am typing it in, and once I get to the, the Google page, I'm going to click images because we're looking for an, similar shapes and similar mugs. So I'm going to see if I can find anything that reflects that of the reference scene that we were sent. Okay, I'm liking these. I see the word pewter. I haven't really heard that word before, so I'm going to do some digging to make sure that I'm not missing out and do a little bit more historical research. I'm reading through the mugs, okay, and I see this great paragraph um, talking about 18th century mugs. Tend to differ from maker to maker, okay. About the middle of the 18th century, mugs with a tulip shape or a U shape were introduced. So that's good to know. Um, it really, every director is different. Some will care a lot more about whether or not it's the exact period shape of the cup. But the big pull away from this, I think, was the word pewter. So now I'm going to look at reproduction production pewter steins, since I'm still sticking with, with, with the word steins. Um, I see this regimental beer steins website. Click on that. All re reproductions. Okay, all... Okay, this is just an article about defining reproduction, reproductions, but this is a great th thing to have just in case I want to go back and look for more um, historical information. Okay, so I'm going to keep looking. I keep seeing a lot of pewter, which is great. I see this great website, SKS Pewter Stein, the Stein Center. That's intriguing. Let's look into this. This could have, I go to old steins because I am looking for older steins. Um, so I'm going to scroll down here and see... Okay, so we have these Norwegian beer steins. They're $180, though, for a set of three. The shape and style is okay, but I think we can find some for cheaper than that. So this time I'm going to search pewter mugs, since a mug shape is kind of more of what I'm looking for anyways. And I see this crafted um, cup company and these pewter tankards. First thing off the bat, I really like this company. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about Amazon later, but I try and search out different sources other than Amazon as you can see here getting a lot of good style options which is great and the pricing isn't too terrible um, cups are going to be one of those things that even if you spend a lot of money on them now you know you're going to have them in your stock for a long time so it's something that you can spend a little bit mo more money on depending on your budget of course so here's a half pint tankard nine ounces standard grade okay um, $42.95 not a bad price at all um, obviously, if you need 10 of them, you have to buy them all at once. That adds up. But again, we talked about other ways that you could take away some of those costs, be it renting or sourcing from another place. So here I'm just making sure I see lead-free pewter. Again, that would answer some questions um, about whether or not they're safe to drink out of how many flu ounces they have. And I have a couple more at the bottom that are similar styles. So having seen this, I feel pretty happy about this option, but of course I'm going to keep looking. Here I am flipping through a couple of the picture options. But again, I don't want to just go with the first thing I see. I want to make sure that I am um, doing my research. So let's go back and let's look up pewter mugs again and see what we can get again. I'm keeping that tab open. As you can see, I keep a lot of tabs open just to keep track of um, all of my sources and links. This time I am going to look on Amazon just to see what they have to offer. 
Um, Amazon is a great resource to have, 100%. As you can see here, it's $75.99, although we didn't look at shipping at the last website, which can be something that gets you, so make sure you keep an eye on shipping. A lot of times, Amazon Prime has no shipping, which is great, but if you're on a deadline, you can't always depend on Amazon to be readily available. There have been packages that have come late multiple times when I was have been working in the past. Um, so Amazon can be a great resource for finding items and possibly getting them to you fast, but it doesn't have the same sort of relationship as you could have with a um, supplier and having a discussion with them and forming a connection with them. So I'd always encourage you to, of course, you can look at Amazon, but also look outside the box and research to see if there are any other opportunities out there. Okay, so that completes Making a Show, a Props Master's point of view. Again, my name's Ellie Fangman, and thank you so much for stopping by, and thank you to the Louisville Creative Arts Academy for hosting this masterclass. If you have any further questions, you can reach out to the Louisville Creative Arts Academy, and they can give you my contact information.